And well, it's no accident that Nietzsche said uh, the greatest psychologist he ever met was Dostoevsky. Everything he learned about psychology, he learned from Dostoevsky's novels and all the insights that would later become popularized, you know, in the 20th century by Freud, they'd all been anticipated 50 years earlier. Um, a question that everyone wants to know, uh, and, may, and you can tell us, I think, you can finally be the arbiter of this question, which everyone asks, and no one knows the answer to. Can literature make us better people? I'm here with Dr. Andrew Kaufman. He is a professor at the University of Virginia. He's well known for his really amazing project, Books Behind Bars, which we might hopefully get a chance to, uh, to talk about today. Um, and also, I reached out to him because of his recent book, The Gambler Wife, uh, which we're also going to talk about. Dr. Kaufman, how are you today? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Amikai. Of course. Um, okay. So this book is titled The Gambler Wife, A True Story of Love, Risk, and the Woman Who Saved Dostoevsky. Um, what brought you to writing this book? Why, why a book about Dostoevsky's wife? So, uh, in fact, you mentioned books behind bars. Um, 10 years ago, my focus was on Tolstoy. I wrote, I'd written a couple of books about Tolstoy. The last one was called Give War and Peace a Chance, Tolstoyan Wisdom for Troubled Times. Um, and, um, and the more time I spent working with inmates, we teach, we work with adult and youth inmates in books behind bars, and my students have conversations with them about Russian literature. The more I took an interest in Dostoevsky and, and had a deeper appreciation of Dostoevsky, um, there's a there's a, a well known a little a well known secret in Russian literary circles that you either love Dostoevsky or you love Tolstoy, but you can't possibly love both of them because they're both so very different. And their sensibilities are so different, and for the longest time I thought that was true, and I was a Tolstoy guy. But my work with inmates um, really helped me to begin to appreciate the genius of Dostoevsky, who was himself incarcerated, who wrote about many of the, the themes that inmates were very interested in. Um, so I took more of an interest in Dostoevsky. As I started reading biographies and doing research about him, I kept coming across this name, Anna Dostoevskaya, who was his second wife. And it was clear, even from the biographies, that this woman was important to his life and um, you know, and a, and a very accomplished woman. But it wasn't until I started digging into her, her um, you know, archives and memoirs and unpublished materials um, by her and, and memoirs of others about her that I started to appreciate just how extraordinary and accomplished and empowered um, and complex a woman she was. And so her story started to really intrigue me. Why is it there had never been a book about her in English. I discovered there were actually two books about her in Russian, um, but given the important role that she played in Dostoevsky's life and in Russian literary history, there should have been 20 books about her, and yet there were none, and so I, I couldn't believe it, and so it became clear to me that, um, that I needed to write this book to introduce the world to this woman without whom Dostoevsky would not have been Dostoevsky. There would be no Brothers Karamazov. There would be no the idiot, there would be no the adolescent or the possessed, it, had it not been for Anna when she came into his life at the time that she did. Yeah, that's an amazing thesis that you're arguing for, uh, that, 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 that the fact that she played such an important role in history. Um, and I want to draw that out a little bit. Um, but before we, before we do, was it challenging to write a biography about Dostoevsky's wife because Dostoevsky, of course, casts such a long shadow? Uh, it's, a really, it's, a really important, it's a really important question. And it's one that I thought a lot about while I'm writing it and while I was writing it. And one of the things that was important to me is to, um, is to make sure ultimately that Anna was the hero of this book, that this was her story told from her perspective and of course, you know, his perspective is, 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 is a necessary one because it was their partnership, it was their love, their marriage that ultimately led to, you know, many of these creations of, of his um, and also that afforded her the opportunity to have a really interesting career of her own. But ultimately, I did not want to fall prey to what I saw in so many of the biographies, which was 
she was always described either as an appendage, um, which is the assumption that so many people have about 19th century uh, wives of, of great writers, um, that they were just sort of there in the background, you know, taking care of the family while her husband did all these, you know, great important things. And um, I wanted to avoid falling prey to that stereotype, especially because it wasn't true um, in Anna's case. And I also had to, um, and so she became increasingly over the time that I was researching and thinking about this book, she became the focus of the book so much so that the title changed. My original title for this book, a lot of people don't realize this, was The Gambler's Wife, emphasizing her in the context of him and his gambling addiction. But with time, I realized that there are actually two gamblers in this relationship. And one of them was actually the more successful of the two, and that was Anna. And so I had to be very conscious of the story I was telling and from whose perspective um, and giving her the agency in the narrative that she actually had in her life. Yeah, and that exactly anticipates what my next question was, because the title, The Gambler Wife, is a bit of a jarring title because you expect it to be The Gambler's Wife. Um, and, but, but of course, that's not the title. And um, you have alluded to the fact that she, she took big risks and gambles in her career. Um, it seems to me that it alludes to uh, an amazing scene in the book, um, which, which has certainly stayed with me and I think would stay with any reader where Anna sits down at a roulette table um, and, and plays, uh, plays some roulette. Well, let me, I can share with you more, more about that because that was a, a major decision in, yeah. in the book. And, and there's many different layers to it. So you alluded to the scene which comes up in the second part of the book um, when they're in there in the throes of Dostoevsky's gambling addiction. They had been together now for, you know, they'd been married for only a couple of months. They were on their honeymoon um, in Europe. And the reason they were, took this honeymoon is because right after they got married, there was all sorts of trouble at home. Dostoevsky's in, uh, relatives, um, you know, his sister-in-law and his stepson didn't like Anna. They didn't want this woman to be um, in their home because, she, because they had been so used to mooching off of Dostoevsky and taking advantage of, of his money for all these years. And, and they now realized that there was someone who stood between him, um, between, you know, his pocketbook and them, and that was on it. And so they did whatever they could to try to scuttle this marriage. And I describe all of that in, in the first part of the book. And so Anna makes an amazing decision. She, she, she says, in order to save our marriage, we have to raise enough funds to get out of Petersburg, to go take a honeymoon to Europe. Um, but they didn't have enough money to do that. So she sold, she pawned her dowry. And at first Dostoevsky wasn't gonna let her do that. Um, but she, that was one critical moment in their relationship where she understood that if she didn't do that, then that might've been the beginning of the end of their marriage. So the reason I'm setting up this context is because it's, it's important to understand that she was already taking risks in this, in this marriage, in this case, a risk to save the marriage, even when Dostoevsky was hesitant to do it. Um, but he knew how to listen to her when she was right. Um, that was also a pattern in their relationship. He stopped talking and started listening and Anna was almost always right. Uh, her judgment call, call was almost always right. And so they left to take uh, uh, their honeymoon to Europe. And, and at first it started off beautifully and they were strolling through the, the streets you know, of Dresden where they lived for the first couple of months and you know, hanging out at the cafes on the Elba River. And I visited all these sites and went to all these places where they stayed and I basically traced their steps of this honeymoon. Um, and then a couple of weeks into their stay, Dostoevsky started getting restless. And he asked Anna, he said, you know, I'd like to take a trip to Bad Hom Homburg, which was a resort a couple hundred kilometers away, and I'd like to gamble. And she didn't think much of it because she had known that he had, you know, a, he was a gambler. She, the, the book that she had, um, she, that he had dictated to her when she first came into his life was called The Gambler, and it was based on his own experiences in Europe a few years prior. So it's not that she was unfamiliar with this, but she had no idea what kind of a gambler he was, how reckless he was, and that he was a serious, a serious problem gambler, an addict. And so she started getting letters from him every day. She went to the post office, and every letter 
you know, he's telling her how much he lost that day. And he was asking her to send her, send him more money, which she did. And then the next day he would lose that. And, and this went on. And anyway, he finally came back uh, to Bad Homburg. They moved to Baden Baden. And that is when his gambling mania basically went off the deep end. And yeah. now she is escorting him to the casino and she's watching him, um, you know, with his bloodshot eyes and his white face, kind of in the throes of this terrible addiction. She's doing everything that she can to try to lure him away from the tables. Um, and if that, you know, should that fail, she would, she would feign a headache or should that fail? She was even trying to advise him. You know, she studied wherever she went. She studied the people. She was a great people watcher. She was studying the other players and she thought she understood how he could win at gambling. So he was, she was trying to advise him and he refused to listen to that. And so every day, you know, he was begging her, you know, begging for her forgiveness, you know, for poisoning her life. He was begging her for more money. Um, and this went on, he pawned her wedding dress, her wedding ring, her favorite brooch. I mean, this was a low point in their relationship. And one day she cracked, she snapped and she threw the money at him, literally threw the coins at him. And she said, to hell with this, you go do whatever you want with our money. I don't care anymore. And in her diary, she wrote, you know, if he thinks I'm his slave here to obey his every whim, then it's about time he abandoned that uh, delusion of his. And the very next day to help him abandon that delusion is that she did what he forbade her to do. He never wanted her to go to the casino without him because he didn't believe it was a place for a young, proper, pregnant woman to be. She went to the casino in secret, alone, to gamble. Um, and I describe that scene in the book of her gambling at this very low point in their relationship. Um, and he shows up. It's, it's completely uncanny how this happened, but um, she's thinking, and this is all 100% factual, and this book is nonfiction. Everything is documentable fact. She's thinking, wow, I'd love him to come in now and see me winning. And at that very moment, there he was at, in the door. She saw him out of the corner of her eye, and he runs up to her, and he's furious with her, and he chastises her for coming to this place alone. And he escorts her out of the casino and he tells her, you know, how dare you do this? You know, you're bound to lose everything. And she says, well, I've noticed things like that happen to you too. Um, so she's very defiant in this moment. And then he starts teasing her for the next couple of days, calling her my little gambler wife. Boy, my little gambler wife, you sure are lucky that I came in just in the nick of time to save my poor lost gambler wife. And that phrase, gambler wife, I, I want to thank Dostoevsky for that incredibly condescending remark, because that is where I got the idea for the new title of the book. And of course, Anna was a gambler wife in many more senses than even he could appreciate at this point in their relationship. She didn't just go to the casino to gamble. Her entire life was one gamble after another. Her decision to marry him in the first place, her decision to pawn her dowry. Um, her decision to, um, you know, there are many other decisions along the way, and I'm sure we'll get to publishing her publishing career, the way she well, didn't sell the, the big... rights and to, to his legacy. And right. If I remember correctly. Yeah. She was an entrepreneur. And so exactly yeah. by definition, she was a gambler, only she was a strategic gambler. She was a shrewd calculating gambler who made and sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. She enabled Dostoevsky at one point. There's another scene where when Dostoevsky is going through some writer's block, or something. He's unable to uh, finish a, a manuscript. He says, go to the casino. <laughs> that was a huge moment. That was at the end of their four-year exile in Europe. And they had been in Europe now for four years. Um, she was dying of homesickness. He was dying creatively, but they had to get back to Russia. Otherwise, that would have been the end of them. And she was seven months pregnant. So they had to figure out how they were going to get back. They didn't have any money. The only source of income at that point was his writing but his creativity had dried up. And so Anna being the shrewd psychologist that she was, just like you said, she said, go, go to Wiesbaden, take the 100 of the last 300 dollars that we have and go gamble. And yeah. she knew he would lose it all. And he did, but he came back, he wrote up a storm. He managed to convince the editor to send another thousand ruble advance, which was enough for them to get out of Europe. Yeah. And to give a sense of what we're talking about here, because it, it's quite harrowing to read about the level of addiction that we're, we're dealing with. So this is like the kind of addiction where 
you go somewhere, Dostoevsky will travel to, uh, to, to this town, city, and he'll lose all his money. And then you'll say, please, please, I lost everything. I'm so sorry. Very apologetic and self-effacing. Please send me enough just to go home. And then Anna will send him money to go home and he'll gamble that money away. You know, it's, it's such a extreme level of addiction. Um, and this was at a time when, you, as you point out in the book, uh, gambling wasn't seen as an addiction. Um, there wasn't that kind of modern understanding. Um, I think a modern reader can recognize this level of like extremely compulsive, addictive behavior um, and, and, and may even have like, you know, reference points in their own life. But at the time, you know, I wonder what kind of insight Dostoevsky had into his own, um, his, his own, his own issue, his own problem. Well, it's interesting that the novel that he was working on when he first met Anna, remember she came into his life because he was, he was desperate to meet a publishing deadline. The novel he was working on was called The Gambler, um, which is you know, very telling. This was the first work that kind of brought them together. He hired her to help him finish this novel. She was a stenographer. This was her first job. Had he not finished that novel on time, he would have lost the copyrights to everything he wrote for the next nine years. He had signed a terrible publishing agreement a few years prior because, again, he needed to raise money quickly to get to Europe to go gamble. And that was just sort of part of his, the way he lived his life. And so in that novel, he shows real insight into um, the psychology of gambling. And the, the character, uh, Alexei, in that novel is based very much on Dostoevsky himself. And so he understood, um, he appreciated um, enough about gambling to recognize that there was a craving for risk, this desire to stand just on the edge of the abyss and know that you could fall in, but that you might not. This idea that you could go from everything to nothing or nothing to everything. You go from a prince to a pauper or the other way around, like in a single spin of the roulette wheel. That's where Dostoevsky lived his life in, in those extremes on that perilous edge. And and so he had great insight into the psychology of gambling, it, 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 like even the kind of, kind of intensive gambling that he took part in, but he didn't understand it as a, a veritable illness, right? At that time, they, they didn't talk about gambling as uh, an illness in the way that we do, you know, in the tw after Freud in, in the 20th century and the, with the emergence of biological understanding of the, of the neuropsychology of gambling and all that, that wasn't, so he didn't have any of that understanding. He understood it primarily from a philosophical and a psychological perspective. And he knew that he couldn't stop himself. That much, yeah. that much he knew. I read The Gambler because of your book. After I finished your book, I read The Gambler for the first time. And oh, wow. uh, it's, it's such an amazing scene. He describes this um, older woman with like a large inheritance. People are waiting for her to die uh, to, to, to get her inheritance. And she, you know, goes to the, you know, the casino and she gets addicted to roulette. And he describes this descent into what we would call addiction um, and the story of everyone around her trying to pull her away from the roulette table to rescue whatever, you know, they can salvage of that inheritance before it's all gone. Um, and so that, like you're saying, that's, that's of course, you know, uh, something that Dostoevsky understood deeply um, and was able, you know, to, to articulate. Um, if, I'm glad uh, yeah, you finally read The Gambler. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, glad you read too. a lot of Dostoevsky, but uh, that's a good... It's a good book to know. Yeah. It must have been hard. It was, I mean, not must have. It clearly was hard to be married to Dostoevsky. He wasn't um, the most uh, wonderful, idyllic husband. Um, we've talked about his gambling addiction. And obviously, this is in the context of them being in dire financial straits. Um, you already described the fact that Dostoevsky was uh, in, in a terrible contract at one point with his you know, publishers. Uh, he, he was afraid to go back to Russia because of um, he thought he might end up in a debtor's prison. Uh, on top of that, he had this gambling addiction. And, and Anna saw him as a, as a delicate person because of his epilepsy, um, for example. He wasn't, uh, he could be, you, you already mentioned earlier how he was insensitive to the ways in which Dostoevsky's like stepson would torment, torment her um, and things like that. Was, was um, yeah, w w can you speak to that a little bit? What was it like being married to this, uh, great, this great giant of, uh, of history? Well, for that, you have to read the, the Gambler Wife because I, but I will tell you, it was, um, that's part of the miracle of this story, you know, and that's one of the big questions that, that a modern reader will have. And I even point this out in the book that did she, 
did she make the right decision by staying with this guy, right? Was, was she just enabling him? And, and was she, by hitching her fate to someone who was so unstable in many ways and had all of these problems, not just a gambling addiction, but he had severe epilepsy and he was financially reckless and he had an explosive you know, temper and all of these things. By choosing to hitch her fate to him, was she abandoning her dream, which she'd always had as a young woman, of being an independent feminist. She was a young Russian feminist. She was part of the Russian feminist movement. And when she first met Dostoevsky, it was because he had hired her. This was her first job. Um, and so, you know, um, did she abandon that dream by once she fell in love with him and realized who he was by staying with him, should she have left him? And so that's a question that I hope readers will, will ask and come to, you know, what are their own conclusions. But my own feeling is that part of what makes her so fascinating is that she was both extremely progressive and ambitious and intelligent and, and a gambler, as we've talked about, a shrewd gambler who, had, who was enormously accomplished, accomplished as a publisher, who earned her family $5 million in today's money from her publishing enterprise. I mean, just in, in, in being the first sole um, woman publisher in Russian history, I mean, just really extraordinary. And yet that's what makes her so progressive. And yet she was also extremely traditional because she believed in a traditional marriage. She loved Dostoevsky, she married him for love. And at that time, that was actually a cardinal sin for young feminists. You were not supposed to marry for love. Um, that, was, that was forbidden. Um, and so Anna kind of broke all the rules of, um, you know, of, the, of, the, of the feminist script by having the qualities of a feminist, but also by marrying for love, by staying um, at her husband's side and supporting him through the worst years of their marriage, of his addiction. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it's extraordinary. And, and so that's what makes this a love story as well. You know, how, yeah. where she found the strength of heart and the almost, the almost Christ-like, you know, will, ability to withstand um, this torment and, and still love him and, and to not judge him for his gambling addiction. And it's no coincidence that Dostoevsky once said to her earlier in their honeymoon, he said, it's for those like you that Christ uh, came. And he wasn't being ironic. I mean, I can imagine if I said that to my wife, she would like, you know, roll over and think, you know, like, what, who is this guy saying this crazy thing? But when Dostoevsky said those words, he meant it. He really believed he saw in Anna just an extraordinary forbearance and a compassion that he had never experienced in any of the previous women in his life. Um, and that inspired so much of his own um, ideas about compassion, which would become a major theme in his, in his writings uh, over the course of their relationship. Sonia, for example, Sonia crime, from Crime and Punishment. Crime and punishment. And, and her relationship to Raskolnikov uh, comes to mind. And, and you mentioned that uh, parallel, I think, um, explicitly. But um, that seems to be at least one example of where uh, this character, of you know, Anna's unbelievable love and compassion and patience uh, seems to um, appear, this Christ-like nature. Um, and also, it, it makes me think of, of the importance of allowing for, you know, nuance and complexity when we, when we think about these questions of what it means, um, you know, to, to be a feminist, or even if she wasn't a feminist, but what it means to how we think about profiles of courage, you know, in history, like the different models that mm -hmm. people can, the different paths people can walk and be, you know, courageous uh, women uh, throughout history and, and the way it could take different forms. I just want to say something about that, because that, that, that is, there's an interesting subtext to this book. You asked me, you know, early on uh, what it was like, you know, telling, writing the story of a woman who had been passed over by, by history and what were the challenges. One of the, one of the, um, one of the opportunities was to make sure that this book is, as you know, is mostly story. There's, you know, there's enough analysis, enough explanation to help readers appreciate what was happening in Russia at the time and what was this feminist movement about um, and what was going on in Dostoevsky's life. So I, I contextualize that, but ultimately I let the story speak for itself. 
and by doing that, what I hoped to have accomplished is to help readers appreciate how irreducibly complex people are, and Anna is. And so these labels that we like to throw around, uh, you know, a feminist or a progressive or traditional, none of those applied because she was all of those and none of those. And so, so this story really helps readers, I hope, appreciate a woman who really defied all the stereotypes and who wrote the script of what it meant to be a woman in 19th century Russia, um, all entirely, you know, she borrowed from existing scripts, but she rewrote the feminist script in her own voice. And she transcended all stereotypes and, um, and the ways that we often categorize people. Um, and so it was very important to me in the story to let the story speak for itself and let all these complexities play out and then allow the reader to make their own judgment. Yeah. The Dostoevsky lived a famously tragic life. Um, we don't get necessarily, we, we definitely don't get the full biography of Dostoevsky in, in the book about the biography of Dostoevsky's wife, of course. Um, but, but it seems like um, the, the, the tragedy that, that, that comes up here um, most, most centrally is the loss of, of their two children. Um, is that right? And, 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 and what was the name of the second, of the second child? Um, uh, Alo um, Al Alyosha. Al Alyosha. Alyosha. So the first one, um, yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of harrowing moments in this book. And, and one of them is that moment in 1868 when their first child was born. They were still in Europe. They were in Geneva at the time, and, and they were both so looking forward. This is such an inflection point in their relationship. Dostoevsky had long wished to have a child, and, and here it was a reality. Their, their baby girl, Sonia, was born in January, um, and then um, in May, or February, rather, and then a couple of months later in May, she suddenly died, tragically, of, of a flu-like um, illness. And it just devastated them both. And so this was one of the tragedies that they lived in the, the first four years of their marriage. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, she had, they had another child in, 18, um, in 1869. That child would live. Um, that would become uh, Lyubov, um, or otherwise known as Luba, uh, who was um, there, ended up being their first daughter who survived. And she became the noose around Anna's neck later on in life. Mm -hmm. uh, when she rejected Russia and declared herself a European and wrote a biography insisting that Dostoevsky wasn't even really Russian. Um, and I talk a little bit about that in the book. Um, and then there was a, another child that was born, the one that was, she was, Anna was going to give birth to um, in 1871 and the reason that they had to get back to Russia. And that child was Fe Fyodor Fedya, um, who in fact did survive um, into old age. And then another child, Alyosha, who was born in 1875 and then died three years later of uh, complications resulting from epilepsy. And so I describe all of these scenes in the book because these were, you know, huge moments in their, in their life together. Yeah. And you describe how Anna had to bear the grief of, 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 of that tragedy and also worry about her husband. Um, who she saw as being so so fragile, and, and, and in a way he was. Um, the book, The Brothers Karamazov, is, is my favorite book of all time. It, it seems to me, perhaps the central theme in the book is grief. Um, there might be other central themes as well, but it's such a central theme in the book. Um, the, the book ends with the story of this death of a child, Ilyosha, which is just, you know, so, 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 so intense. You have... Um, not there's there's two similar sounding names Ilyosha and then Alyosha Alyosha who's who mourns the death of his father Zosima um, towards the middle of the book and then of course one of the most just intense dramatic uh, scenes early on in the book I'm, I'm tempted just to read a little bit of it to give a sense here is uh, from this chapter Women of Faith when you you the story of a woman coming on pilgrimage to see this uh, sage his father Zosima. And, and she describes uh, losing, losing her son. Um, and so, if, I mean, just forgive me if it's okay to, to read a, a little bit of this. I think, it's, I think it's, of course, speaks to the depth of pain that Dostoevsky is able to tap into um, from, from his own experience. 
He says, she says to, to Father Zosima, I pity my little son, dear father. He was three years old, just three months short of three years old. I grieve for my little son, father, for my little son. She goes on, says he was the last, I, uh, she was the last son left to them. I, uh, this last one I buried and I can't forget him. It's as if he's just standing right in front of me and won't go away. My soul is wasted over him. I look at his clothes at his little shirt or his little boots and start howling. I lay out all that he left behind, all his things and look at them and howl. Then I say to Nikitushka, that's my husband, let me go on a pilgrimage master. He's a coachman, we're very poor father. And it goes on and on. And it's, I mean, the first time I read this and and certainly subsequently after I had children, it's hard to read this and and not choke up. It's, It's so... Uh, such an intense description of grief. Um, and, and, and you say this, that this, this draws directly from, from his experience. Is that, is that right? Yeah, even down to the name of the child, Alyosha. Yeah. So this, this um, that was the name of the, his child that had, had died. Yeah, that conversation in the book, um, by all accounts, came directly out of Dost- from Dostoevsky's conversation with the character that this Zosima was based on, a very famous monk, a confessor um, at, a, at a well-known monastery. And that was the monastery that Dostoevsky went to. And, uh, and Dostoevsky shared his grief. Uh, and, and then this is what Zosima told him, the, the elder told him. But what's so interesting is that this is a woman of faith. So what's really intriguing about this is Dostoevsky, it's almost as if he is understanding the depth, not just of his pain, but of his wife's pain. Um, Something that he was not always good at expressing or or kind of uh, communicating to her. And yet in his art, in that scene, uh, he almost switches roles, even though he's the one who goes on the pilgrimage and she's the one who suggests that he goes on the pilgrimage, he reverses it in that scene and has, uh, has the husband suggesting that the wife go on a pilgrimage, almost as if he understands that the person who is truly grieving here and suffering is his own wife. And he, even if he couldn't communicate that in directly to her, he did communicate it in his art. And it shows the depth of appreciation of, that he had for her suffering. Um, yeah, and so it's, that scene came directly out of his own experience. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's quite that's quite remarkable, and I'll just just put a note that that you know the answer that Father Zosima gives is um, he says he says you should weep, you know he says that that women you know the women who lose their children uh, should weep and 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 like the heavens rejoice you know at, at your weeping or something like that. And you know what's interesting? Again, I think Dostoevsky's insight into the condition of his wife, she didn't let herself weep. She couldn't she felt that she needed to stay strong because he was falling apart. And so Anna, what did Anna do? She got right back to work. They were publishing the diary of a writer and um, uh, I can't remember if he'd started. Um, yeah, I mean, he's had more to write on the brothers Karamazov and, and Anna was the head of the publishing company. She had to get out the next issue. And, and, um, and so it's really interesting that um, Dostoevsky has Zosima say, allow yourself to weep when he realizes that his wife didn't even allow herself to do that. Um, yeah. And in some ways, Dostoevsky was very helpless, very feckless. Um, he loved his wife deeply and he expressed, you know, in so many different ways, his extraordinary gratitude and his realization um, that he owes so much to her. And yet, um, and yet he could be very feckless and seem very insensitive as a husband. Um, and that was part of his contradiction that in his art, he appreciated the depth of his wife's suffering. Um, but in his life, he didn't, he was not always successful at communicating that to yeah. her or doing things to ease her burden beyond letting her know every minute how deeply she, he appreciated her and how he realized that he probably would not have survived had it not been for her. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, it's definitely true with Dostoevsky, I think, and certainly other authors as well. It seems that the best version of the author is on the written page in a way that they can see, they can 
they could see beyond their own shortcomings in a way. <clears throat> it seems they have more insight um, in, in, their, in their fiction, in their writings than, than in their own life. Um, I, I noticed that about, I wrote about Tolstoy. You know, I wrote my last book on Tolstoy. It's true of Dostoevsky. Um, I, I really want to think about that. Like, why, why is that? Why is the best version? Why is the deepest insights um, and the ability to understand the people closest to you often occurs on the page and not in your everyday um, lived experience? But I also want to say that I don't want to use that as an excuse to say, well, you know, he was a great artist and he put these insights and these feelings into his art. Um, so I'm going to forgive him for not expressing it. He had many failings as a husband, and I don't pull any punches in this, in this book. I, I am very clear and direct about that. Um, when his inability to stand up to his conniving in-laws when they were trying to destroy their young marriage and, and his unwillingness or inability to see how much Anna was suffering at the hands you know, of, of his you know, awful, ruthless stepson who was trying to destroy the marriage. Um, he was blind to all that. And for that, he is to be faulted. That was a failing and that caused Anna a lot of suffering. So, you know, I just, I want to call a spade a spade. Um, yeah. Even as I acknowledge that, you know, the better part of him <laughs> came out on the page. Yeah. Since I had this amazing opportunity to talk to you, I don't want to let it go by without asking you to do a reading uh, from the book to give, to give just the, the listener a sense of, of your voice and a sense of the drama and, and the way in which, you know, the stories are, are, are so compelling um, and they draw these characters out. So um, if you're, if you don't mind uh, that, if, if there's a scene in the book where uh, Dostoevsky and Anna are traveling and they, they lose a suitcase, um, which uh, is, is disastrous and, and Anna saves the day. Uh, are you, do you mind, are you able to, um, to read that? Sure. First? So that's from chapter 12. It's a chapter called The Publisher. Um, and the context is this suitcase contained the manuscript, the finished manuscript to the novel, The Adolescent, which is also sometimes translated as a raw youth. They were returning from their summer retreat to Petersburg. Dostoevsky was going to turn in the final manuscript and finally receive their honorarium, um, his honorarium, which they badly needed because Alyosha had just been born. Um, and not only was the manuscript in that suitcase, but all the notes to the novel were too. So when Anna realized after they had arrived at the train station from the steamship dock um, that, that the suitcase was missing, she understood the stakes there and like what that meant, um, that this would have been financially disastrous. It would have been disastrous to his, him creatively. And this is another moment where she kicked into high gear, her survival instinct um, took over. And I'll just read to you um, uh, a couple paragraphs from that scene. It was eight in the evening now, and they were racing. Um, well, I'll start a little earlier. Anna blamed herself both as his wife and his business manager for such carelessness. As she stood leaning against a counter in the baggage room, tears streaming down her cheeks, a thought flashed through her mind. Without telling her husband, she immediately hired a cab to rush her back to the dock. It was eight in the evening now, and they were racing through the shadier part of town where she saw people creeping out of tiny streets in between large gray warehouses. Tramps ran after them, shouting. The frightened cabbie urged the horse on so hard that it broke into a gallop. Upon reaching the dock, Anna jumped out of the carriage, stormed up the ramp to the steamship office, and banged her fists on a dark window. Guard, open up, open up right away, she shouted. Open up, Grandpa, this minute. A big black travel trunk was left here and I've come to get it. It's here, a sleepy voice replied. She asked the guard to carry the trunk to the cab, promising to tip him. He didn't respond. She called to the cabbie to help, but he also refused, afraid his rig might be stolen. And so without a moment's hesitation, Anna ordered the guard to open the door, which he did, and, quote, I grabbed the trunk by its handle and dragged it, stopping at every step. To make matters worse, the ramp was a long one, but I managed to lug it to the cab, at which point the cabbie jumped out and hoisted the 140-pound trunk in between the seat and the coach box, and Anna climbed on top of it and sat down 
resolved not to give it up, even if hoodlums should attack. That's what she wrote. Amazed, the cabbie struck his horse and started down the street as figures emerged and started shouting at them from behind. As they approached the railroad station, Anna caught sight of her visibly distraught husband. She told him the whole story, what they'd almost lost, what she had done to save them. My God, he exclaimed, only think what danger you put yourself into. After all, when those rogues who followed you saw that the cabbie was driving a woman, they might have attacked you, robbed you, maimed you, killed you. His response spoke volumes about their roles within the family. Just think what would have happened to us, to me and the children, he moaned, warning her fecklessly. Oh, Anya, Anya, your rashness will lead you to no good. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And you sort of see him just like playing this role of like the um, oblivious kind of a uh, husband there um, at, where, where she like knows what's going on. Like she's in charge and in control and, and he just doesn't get it, you know? And, and when he said your rashness will lead you to no good and that in fact, he was wrong. It was precisely Anna's risk taking in that moment and in many moments of their relationship that saved him, that saved their career. And had, had she not been a risk taker, um, the adolescent, would have been gone. We would never have that. And so the adolescent was saved that night because of Anna. Not just the adolescent, the novel, but her adolescent husband, uh, who often did resemble an adolescent in so, yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. We're, we're getting towards the end here. Um, what makes Dostoevsky great? We both love him, but why? Why is he special? Oh, boy. Um, I think what makes him special is something that Anna, in fact, appreciated about him as well. He was writing at a time when literature was very politicized. All you had to do is take a position on the ideological debates of the day, whether you were a conservative who believed that the path to the future of Russia lay in the traditions of of the past, or whether you were progressive and believed that the only way forward is through revolution and through progress and you know, modeling European countries. And so these were the big debates of the day. And it was very common for writers to take, take a very clear position on these issues. And that's all they had to do to become topical and popular. Um, and even though Dostoevsky did take a position, he in fact became very conservative later on in life. That is not why we keep reading Dostoevsky today. We keep reading Dostoevsky because he penetrated to such depths of human psychology. He understood the psychology of the people who were trying to overthrow the country and that many of the people, the revolutionaries who who presented themselves as social crusaders were in fact egoists who were trying to prove something, who were trying to resolve something, some deep wound within them and that they were carrying the country over a brink. But because of his deep psychological insight into human nature, into what motivated people, he was able to penetrate layers and and depths of human psychology and to write about social problems from a much deeper psychological um, standpoint than really any writer before him had, including Tolstoy. Dostoevsky called himself very famously, you know, people tried to call him a realist and he said, no, I'm a realist in a higher sense. And that is, I can't remember the exact quote from this point, but that is, I penetrate um, the deeper realities that are hidden from the newspapers and from the history books and from the way that we write about what's happening in society. And in in fact, he did. And that's why, you know, that that more than anything um, is the reason that we, you know, keep reading him today. And that is a point that Anna tried to make over and over again in the last 37 years of her own life after Dostoevsky died, she took it upon herself to secure his, his um, legacy for posterity. And she found herself having to fight against all of these people who were trying to fit Dostoevsky into a political box, who were, tr- who were interpreting him from the perspective of what he was saying about the political situation in Russia. And Anna kept saying, kept saying no, that is not what makes Dostoevsky great. What you need to understand that what makes him great 
is that he penetrated the, he, she even compared him to the Röntgen, the guy who founded the X-ray machine. And she said in the same way that the, this founder of, of the X-ray penetrated, you know, these depths of, of the human body that no one had seen before. So Dostoevsky penetrated the human soul um, in ways that neither Shakespeare nor Tolstoy could even reach. You know, maybe that's debatable, but, um, and she said it would be silly to evaluate um, you know, the founder of the X-ray based on his politics. Similarly, it's silly to try to talk about, you know, Dostoevsky's greatness in terms of his politics, because politics ebb and flow, but genius and psychological genius and artistic genius, um, you know, those transcend all of that. Yeah, that metaphor is exactly right. And it seems to me that when he shined his X-ray on people, you s suddenly saw something of, of a deeply irrational, impulses or or battles you know between good and evil um going on in the heart of man um and a capacity for you know uh for mistake and and for irrationality and and self lacerations um you know so so it's something yeah things that just you know um are are so uh expanding in in you know when we when we think about uh the human experience and well it's no accident that nietzsche said uh, the greatest psychologist he ever met was Dostoevsky. Everything he learned about psychology, he learned from Dostoevsky's novels. And all the insights that would later become popularized, you know, in the 20th century by Freud, they'd all been anticipated 50 years earlier by, by Dostoevsky. Um, and yeah, I'd like, you put it really, really well, the, 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 the contradictions and the self de deception and the, the way in which people don't even understand their irrational impulses, which they can't, they can't even make sense of. Um, and also just the, the, the evil that exists inside of people, but also uh, an awareness that there's an equally powerful impulse for good and compassion. And his characters are constantly battling, um, are constantly battling between those two, between the forces of good and evil. And that Dostoevsky was, uh, was saying in his writing, that is the true battle of the modern world. It's not about the, all this political stuff. That's just a manifestation of a much deeper battle. And God knows we see it today in 2021. I mean, in America, in the world. I mean, these forces of, of good and evil and um, you know, our ability to fall in one, <laughs> in one of those camps and, and, and crawl out and, um, and experience and, and kind of manifest a whole different side of ourselves. Um, that's all around us. Yeah. And rebellion, rebellion against morality, against rationality, against, yeah, all sorts of things like you're saying. Yeah. Um, when people look at when there's, there's been a lot of writ things written up. I, I actually, I was actually, uh, I read about books behind bars, uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, when it was first, um, written up about, and I was, uh, I think anyone who reads it is just, you know, amazed at how, how wonderful, uh, a project it is. Um, and I, I was a, a pleasant, wonderful surprise when I, when I made the connection between the author of the gambler wife and, uh, books behind bars. Um, but but what is it like reading Dostoevsky uh, in the context of of a prison uh, among people who are incarcerated? What have, what have you learned from that from that project? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, that is where my I really started to appreciate the genius of Dostoevsky, because I was I was observing the insights that these incarcerated youth, and now we work with adults, but the insights that they had into Dostoevsky, which were things that I didn't even appreciate. Um, until I started talking to them. And, um, you know, these insights into this battle between good and evil. And when we read Crime and Punishment, for instance, um, you know, their ability to understand Raskolnikov, the murderer, who was trying to convince himself that he committed his crime for a rational reason, because he wanted to, to steal the money from the old pawnbroker and then give it to charity. But of course, he doesn't do any of that. And he has to come to terms with the real reasons he committed his crime, that it was an act of ultimate egoism to prove to himself that he could overstep the normal laws, the normal bounds of morality. Well, these, in, these young inmates understood that in their bones. And they were, they were making discoveries about 
their own crimes. I remember one young man who was talking about, you know, he, how he robbed, um, you know, he came from a family, uh, very poor, a lot of struggles. He had to take care of all of his younger siblings. And so he learned, he became a drug dealer and he stole and he committed crimes just to, to keep his younger siblings afloat. And he grew up without, you know, without a mother, without a father, he was constantly in prison. And he robbed a convenience store and he made a really profound discovery after reading uh, Crime and Punishment that the real reason he robbed that convenience store was not just for the money, but because it was an opportunity to, for him to prove to himself that he could do it, that he had power in a world that made him feel so powerless. And that is an insight that Dostoevsky uh, makes about Raskolnikov, that ultimately what was driving the crime was some deep psychological need he had um, to assert his power in a world that was crushing him. Um, and so I never would have understood that with that level of depth um, before I talked to, before I worked with the incarcerated youth. Um, so yeah. that's an example of what it's like to read Dostoevsky in that environment. Yeah, and I think when you read Crime and Punishment, the, the way in which Dostoevsky describes the experience of living in the lowest rung of society, being this like poor student with like no money and, and, and the, the, the struggles for dignity. And um, yeah, just, just uh, I think are also uh, very relevant to understanding. He, I think he understood criminality in a very deep way, uh, in a way better than, than, than many people often do. Um, and, you know, another example, not criminality per se, but the underground man, the way these, these, these creatures of society, uh, the, way, the way society or, or, or the civilization can uh, sort of trample people and, and break people in all sorts of bizarre ways. Uh, I think Dostoevsky understood. He was a master at that. Um, yeah, go ahead. You have something? To yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I'm very impressed with your, the depth of your knowledge of Dostoevsky and your reading of him. Thank you. Um, a question that everyone wants to know. Uh, and, may, and you can tell us, I think, you can finally be the arbiter of this question, which everyone asks, and no one knows the answer to. Can literature make us better people? It has that capacity, yes. Does it do that by definition? Not necessarily. It's, a, it's an alchemy of um, the book and the person, the right book for the right person at the right time can um, can change a life for the better. And I've seen it happen in books behind bars uh, over and over again. Um, but it, it's that combination, that this, this idea that, that, that just by, you know, ipso facto that a reading a work of literature, a work of great literature makes you a better person. Um, no, it's not necessarily guaranteed. But if you are searching and, and the, the, the work which always has, you know, has it triggers something in you, an insight or a mindset or, or causes a mindset shift um, and opens your mind to a possibility you hadn't considered before. Um, if you were searching and if you wanted to, um, f you know, to gain more insight into the purpose of your existence, then yes, a work of literature can have that power. Um, but, you know, Dostoevsky is an example of, you could also potentially take the wrong message from Dostoevsky. Um, and I've seen that happen too. And that's why you, you, know, you need to be in conversation with people with different perspectives. Yeah. Uh, what's your view on that? Oh, well, I mean, I ask it because I don't know. I mean, that's the truth. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I've, I oscillate, I vacillate on that question. Um, but I, I like your answer and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reflect on your answer. Um, but yeah, I've it, seen it. Tough I've enough. seen it happen. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've seen it happen. I've seen incarcerated youth in books behind bars gaining um, a, a radically new insight into um, themselves, into what's important to them, um, you know, by discussing these characters with UVA students and among themselves. Um, and it just opens a window into a new world. Um, and that starts a process of of transformation, but they were ready for it. They were ready for it. We discussed a lot of uh, important issues, but I think, I think the most important question I can ask you uh, before we finish is, is who's better, Dostoevsky or Tolstoy? 
Oh, the most important question. I actually wrote an article about that for the millions.com um, a, a decade ago. There was a big debate where everyone weighed in on who was better, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. Um, well, you know, what's, um, what's better, Saturn or Jupiter? Um, there, it's not a matter of, of who, who is one of them. It depends on where you are in your life and um, what you take from the writer. I personally, for many years, was much more connected to the message of Tolstoy. Um, I was put off by the extremes of Dostoevsky's world, by the intensity, by the exploration of the tr you know, truly dark side of, of human nature. And so for, the, for many years, I insisted that Tolstoy is who we should read if we want to become better people. But as I get older, um, that view is, is much more complicated now because I think if Dostoevsky can offer us insight into what, where we are as a world right now, and we can listen to that insight, um, then we have a chance of really appreciating and uh, being much more empathetic towards people and, and towards ourselves. Um, so I, um, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I, I once did when I was young, uh, uh, an angry young man, I was all Tolstoy, um, but now, um, I think there's a beauty, um, you know, like I have two children, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. And if someone asked me uh, which one is better, I would say, well, they're very different personalities. Um, and this is what the nine-year-old, these are the beautiful parts of the nine-year-old. And these are the beautiful parts of the six-year-old. And so I would say something similar about Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. I would be much, uh, to me, it's, to me, it's just Dostoevsky. So <laughs> he's better. <laughs> I'm, oh yeah, but of course I'm kidding. Um, why did Russia produce so many great writers in the 19th century around this time? What, what happened? Um, well, I, I mean, I think it had a lot to do with the historical circumstances. A lot happened very quickly in a short amount of time. Russia uh, modernized very quickly. Um, and there were huge clashes between, you know, the the, the people who were nostalgic for the old order and the people who believed that the only path forward was to model themselves on, on European um, examples of, of progress. And so, and then of course there was the revolutionary movement um, that was trying to enact th these beliefs in a very violent way. And in, in the 19th century, there were terrorist attacks on the czar, Alexander II, who ultimately was executed, um, was assassinated by a Russian feminist, by the way, Sofia Pirovska, a very famous story of one of the uh, feminists uh, who was Anna's contemporary was responsible for assassinating the czar. Um, so it's because of these pressures and because of, of the, the confusion and the, the, the tumultuous um, combination of forces that were, uh, that these questions became, these questions became so urgent about what is our path forward? What does it mean to be a moral society? What does it mean to be a good human being in a world with all of this violence? And, you know, and, and, uh, and, and what does it mean to have permanence in a world that is so contingent? I mean, these questions played out in a really radical, visceral, compressed way in a short amount of time in Russian history because of all the tumult, I think. Um, so, you know, that's can, an, an answer that comes to mind. What, what do you think? You've read a, a lot of Russian literature. Uh, I, I don't know. I have, but I don't know the history well enough. I mean, you address a little bit in, in the book towards the end how a sort of a tidal wave of history overtook uh, this creative moment, right? You describe uh, the revolution um, that almost almost killed Anna uh, at one point, uh, the revolutionaries um, in Russia. And, um, but it's, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's historical. I, I, I don't know the history well, but it's, it's, so, it's a fascinating question. Yeah. I think there's one, other, there's one other explanation as I'm listening to you talk. Russian writers, um, and, I, and I point this out in the book, that Russian writers were called upon by their society to be the moral leaders, to talk about the things that were pressing, um, that were urgent in people's hearts that were not being talked about um, or that were suppressed. Russian writers were the conscience of a nation. And so 
when Ru a Russian writer like a Tolstoy or a Dostoevsky or Turgenev or Chekhov or anyone sat down to write, they had the weight of history uh, on them. Um, they were not just storytellers. They were kind of uh, offering a moral compass to, to their country. And I think uh, that is the role that Russian literature has always played. And it was particularly pronounced in the 19th century with all these debates about the future of their country. Um, and that is in, in some ways unique to Russia. And that's why Russian literature can feel sometimes so intense and so urgent and so obsessed with these big urgent life questions that the Russians call the accursed questions. Who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Uh, and that has to do with who, what people expected in Russia, the role that people expected their Russian writers to play, um, which was a greater role and a more fundamental um, urgent role even than writers in other countries. Um, and that's a vast generalization and you know one could pick it apart but I, I think it has something to do with that my last question you've been so so generous with your time and I'm so appreciative my last question when you I could phrase it in multiple ways I could phrase it if you were to ask Dostoevsky is one way to phrase it um what 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 what's the lesson for how we should live you know, if you were to ask us, you know, how should we be living? Or, or another way to phrase it, when you look at his corpus of work, who do you draw inspiration from, from his cast of characters? What, what, what lessons do you draw or can we draw concretely from his books as a, as a model of, of good wisdom or, or good living? Well, I mean, I think that's simple. I think in a world that is, it is, that is defined by the battle between good and evil and the good and evil that exists in everyone's heart, um, Dostoevsky would say um, that there's only one model, and, and that is the model exemplified by Father Zosima and Brothers Karamazov and his protege, Alyosha, and that is radical compassion. Who, who will throw the first stone? Who here is without sin? Um, and, and the answer is, of course, nobody. Dostoevsky understood that really profoundly and really deeply. And when you truly appreciate that and accept that about yourself, about human nature, it softens you profoundly. And, and it makes it very difficult for you, for a person to insist that they know the truth or that they're right and someone else is wrong or that their you know, life is, is more valuable than another life. It just changes your whole worldview. And, and, the, you go about life um, with a, a much greater humility and, and, um, and an appreciation um, that you too have sinned and that it is your duty um, to be compassionate and strive for compassion, both in, uh, of yourself and, and of others. And the minute you lose sight of that, you, you start down a very slippery slope of egoism and arrogance and revolution you know, where a group, a young a group of revolutionaries in Russia thought that they knew the path to the utopian future, to the social, socialist utopia that everyone was dreaming of. And so they felt that they were justified um, committing acts of evil and violence in the name of that utopia, including executing their own brothers and sisters, in, including locking people up in Soviet prison camps. That's the path that you go down when you forget that you too have sinned. Um, and that our ultimate, resp ultimate responsibility to one another is um, forbearance and compassion. Yeah. And also, I think Alyosha and Zosima are, are the healthiest in a way. They're, they're the most resilient of all of his characters. They're the most stable and, and successful in a way, whereas other characters are you know, rocked by, by the events. They, 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 they keep an even keel. And so yeah. I think that's a, a wonderful, wonderful answer. Um, and I think it's also a good place for us to stop. What, what can you leave us with? Any final thoughts before we, uh, before we go? Wow, that was pretty heavy. I, I don't think I can, top, um, I can top what I just said. I, the only thing I guess I will say is that I hope after people um, you know, read this book, The Gambler Wife, and learn about um, the woman who was behind <laughs> without whom Dostoevsky would not have been Dostoevsky, um, I hope that they will never be able to pick up a copy of The Idiot or The Adolescent or The Possessed or The Brothers Karamazov and read it the same way again. That's my hope with this book.
Yeah. Dr. Kaplan, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Amikai. Thank you.